Thank you, Tom. And good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It really is a delight to be back in Alaska and just to uh, breathe the air. Because in Houston at this time of the year, you never go outside. You can't risk going outside or you melt in the humidity and the heat. So it's lovely to be here. Lovely to see old friends and uh, I look forward to the next couple of days of renewing acquaintances. The preface to my remarks, ladies and gentlemen, today the Dow dropped 250 points on the fear that tomorrow Moody's will downgrade 15 banks in their financial rating. It says something about the weakness of the economy. It says something about the state of play in the world's richest nation. It says something about the mind and the mood of the American investor, and in my opinion, the American consumer. We have had three years in a row where from January to April, we watched gasoline prices rise irrationally. We watched consumer disposable income decline in proportion to the rise in the gasoline prices. For three years in a row, we have watched the volatility of the stock market in the May and June and July period generally downward in direction. And for three years in a row, we've experienced growth rates in the two and a half to three percent range in the third and fourth quarters of the year, only to see the growth rate decline to the two percent range as we experience the high gasoline prices. You would think after three years in a row, of the same exact economic performance, you would think that the leadership of a country that has experienced this pain, this economic pain, would do something about it. We're in an election year. We're getting words on all sides. We hear about an all-in, all-the-above energy policy. Nice words, interesting to hear. We hear on the other side, we can go back to the policies that we've seen in the past of freeing markets up so they can work. And those words are repeated over and over again. What are Americans to do when we are led by leaders who use words, not actions? Words, not actions, to make believe that they're solving problems. This economy, this great American engine of economic ingenuity that produces people like Bill Gates and Mark Zuckerberg and Steve Jones and Warren Buffett and so many others. As I crisscross the nation, I'd say the temperature of the nation is somewhere south of 97 degrees Fahrenheit. Meaning that people are worried, people are scared, people are nervous. We can't forget that the median income of this nation the median average family income of this nation is $50,000 a year for a family of four, which means over half of the people in this country live on less than $50,000 a year, and high gasoline prices bite right into their disposable income and their ability to support whatever else they need to do in life. Now, maybe for some people who prefer to use limousines, they don't really care about the gas prices. And maybe those limousines crisscrossing the streets of Washington, going to and from Capitol Hill, are carrying people that may have ideas, but translating ideas into action seems to be paralyzed, particularly at the federal level. We need leaders who execute plans, ladies and gentlemen. And let me just give you the example of a plan to address this issue of high transportation fuel costs. If 
because we'd better be worried. The current slump in the oil price, and by the way, the oil price dropped $3 today to $81 and change. As we see the slipping in the oil price, we're not doing anything to remedy what would happen if we saw higher economic growth. When economic growth demands more energy to fuel the economic growth itself. And the actions that need to be taken are not that difficult, ladies and gentlemen. So let me give you an example. This is a plan that could work. This is a plan for America. This is a plan where we can actually exercise the last four letters of our nationality. It's the I can plan. It's one we've been waiting for. It's one we need. It's one that only takes couple of steps to make it happen. We're live in a country where at full employment we need 20 million barrels a day of crude oil to get through the day. 20 million barrels of crude oil equals 10,000 gallons of oil a second. A second. We're down around 18 million barrels a day now because of the recession and because people just haven't been able to spend the, on the things they would like to spend, which would put them in the car, so we're driving less miles. Some people may say, well, that's good. Well, maybe that's good for some people who have practiced a theology of anti-oil, but the reality is we live in a nation that has no public transportation system to speak of, and we rely upon personal transportation as part of our basic entitlement to freedom and choice of the way of life in which we live. And to deny people their freedom because of an artificially imposed high gasoline price because of public policy's failure to address domestic production of energy is disgraceful. But here's the plan. Number one, go back to where we used to be in the production of oil. We used to produce 10 million barrels a day. We got as low as five. In the last three or four years, we've come back to six thanks to all the bits and pieces that are happening in much of the Midwest. All the bits and pieces would include things like the Bakken Formation in North Dakota, the Marcellus, the Utica, the, Bay of, the uh, Fayetteville, the Barnett, the, the Eagle Fort, all very important places where private landowners are agreeing to contract out their mineral rights, where companies with state permits are able to go in and produce more oil and natural gas. That's terrific. In fact, with the use of new technology, we have found more natural gas and able to produce that natural gas with hydraulic fracturing and horizontal well technology than we ever, ever imagined in our history. But let's stay with oil for a moment. We used to produce 10. We know we have more oil than we'll ever need in this lifetime. As far out into the future as we can see, let's produce it. We know where it is. You in Alaska. Hold a great abundance of it. You and Alaska are facing a decline in oil production, and it's been a sustained decline over time. It's putting enormous pressure on how you finance your state. And heaven forbid you think about an income tax to prop up the government, when in fact, the manner in which you've funded the state's activities and have brought this state to the great position that it's in has been on natural resource development, but you're prohibited from natural resource development. What kind of a system is this? And it's beyond your control. How does that work in a democracy that is beyond your control? It's irrational. That's what it is. But 10 million barrels a day, ladies and gentlemen, only gets us to half of what we need. Half of what we use in a full employment economy. So it's not enough. But at least it can't be attacked as a drill baby drill tactic. Because if we're just going back to where we've been, how can you call that drill baby drill? It's simply reverting to historic trend. And we know where it is, and we know how to do it. Second part of the plan. Listen to Boone Pickens. Boone Pickens is not a silly actor. He's a serious investor. Boone Pickens talks about compressed natural gas for trucking. We could displace 2 million barrels of oil a day, stop buying it from abroad by, by using natural gas for trucking. Yes, we need infrastructure. And yes, we need distribution and logistics management to make it happen. And yes, we need vehicles. 
But over a sustained period of time, all that can unfold. And two million barrels a day of less imports means we are less vulnerable to what happens outside this country. That also represents about 12 BCF of natural gas. And with the natural gas price being what it is, the natural gas industry could use a new market. In fact, I go for as far as to say that the natural gas industry should learn a lesson from Apple. You might say, what possibly could Apple and natural gas have in common? Apple is brilliant at creating new markets, isn't it? Those of you who have an iPad or an iPhone or any other device from Apple, they're excellent at producing new markets to grow their business. Natural gas should produce new markets. CNG for trucking is a new market. 12 BCF equals 2 million barrels of imports that we don't have to import anymore. Third, if we can use natural gas for trucking, how about natural gas for cars? But there's a problem with natural gas for cars in that the tankage that you would need is really not compatible with the design of most vehicles. Those of you with SUVs, you lose the rear end, the back end, where you tend to carry things. Those of you with sedans, you lose the trunk. Nobody wants to lose the trunk. Nobody wants to lose the back of the SUV. So natural gas, compressed natural gas for personal vehicles is probably not viable from a consumer's point of view. So let's turn that natural gas into a liquid fuel. Let's call it methanol. Let's make methanol for natural gas. Let's make about 18 BCF of more natural gas production and make it ethanol or methanol, which could be combined with natural with gasoline or mixed with ethanol, and we have a domestic source of transportation fuel, eliminating another 3 million barrels a day of imported oil. That means with 10 million barrels a day of crude oil production, 2 million barrels a day of CNG for trucking, 3 million barrels a day equivalent of natural gas for methanol, we're at 15 million barrels a day equivalent of what we need in a full employment economy making us less dependent upon imported oil. We're also on a journey to higher mileage vehicles. Let's stay on that journey. Let's decrease our demand for oil by another 2 million barrels a day with higher technology vehicles, more efficient vehicles, including hybrids and plug-in hybrids, and yes, including battery cars. And over time, that fleet grows. We use 2 million barrels a day less oil. We're at the equivalent of 17 million barrels a day in a country that needs 20. Where do we get the rest? Well, if you live on the lower 48, you look north. You look north to Canada. Or you look south to Mexico. So here's a North American solution to take all care of all of our transportation needs to meet that 20 million barrel a day requirement of a full employment economy. And if we proceeded down that path, guess what? We would have a full employment economy. How can we say that? Well, a 3 million barrel a day increase over the current journey that we're on to a 7 million barrel a day production, which we should achieve in the next couple of years, adds another 40% to the oil industry output. 40% larger once we get to 7 million barrels a day. So we grow and we keep growing. The increase to 30 BCF a day, 30 billion cubic feet of new natural gas in a country that currently produces 60 BCF is a 50% improvement. You look at a 50% improvement in the production of natural gas and a 40% improvement in the production of oil, my goodness, what would it take to produce that? It would take millions and millions of jobs, trillions of dollars of investment. At full investment cycle, to work on this plan, just do the math of what it would take to get to 10 million barrels a day and 90 BCF of natural gas, turning that natural gas into methanol, building the infrastructure to make that distributed, distributed across the United States, you're looking at close to a trillion dollars a year of capital investment and not one penny of government money, not one penny of public money, because it would come from private investors who want a bigger return on their investment than sitting their cash on the sidelines the way they're doing today.
trillions of dollars sit idle in this economy because no one has faith that it's going anywhere. Nobody has confidence in the decisions that are being taken because mostly no decisions are being taken. This nation of doers, this nation of innovators, this nation of entrepreneurs is being held back by a government that doesn't seem to mind the muddle through life of the nation in its current experience. Muddling through is not the description I would use to characterize the history of this country. But muddle through is essentially the words being used by pundits on both sides of the political spectrum. Words being used by former presidents, words being used by CEOs and former CEOs, muddle through. What an awful description of the status quo, muddle through. To where? To a generation of muddle throughers? Is that what we offer our young people? Is that what we offer our next generation? Get excited about the future, muddle through. That's not who we are. We could do the five-step plan that I just described starting tomorrow. All it takes are government enablers. What it would deliver is a rejuvenation of this economy, an expansion of economic value creation, a guarantee of energy security and national security, and an opportunity for Americans to go have purposeful work in almost any area they want to because it's a tide that would lift all ships. It's not just the trillion dollars of capital to rebuild the transportation fuel system. It would also fund the kind of economic multiplier that improves the housing market, that improves the automobile and truck market, that improves almost any market you could imagine, including possibly lifting the median income of the nation as we experience newfound prosperity. And I would all but guarantee I would guarantee it if I had a crystal ball. I would all but guarantee that the expansion that would occur in this economy over the 20 teens, the 2020s, and the 2030s would exceed the economic expansion equivalent of what we went through as a nation in the 50s and the 60s and the 70s. And you, of course, know what happened in this state in that period. You became a state. And you became a great state. Why won't it happen? What's going to stop it? We have three barriers to overcome, ladies and gentlemen, and they are real. And they are harsh. And they are hard. And they are difficult. And they come down to people. The first barrier is the perversity of partisanship that seems to drive our elected officials. The perversity of partisanship in which one weighs one side's way forward is the only way forward because the other side is, dis is disabused or abused. Presented as irrational and unseemly and impossible. One side attacks the other side, ad hominem. How much worse could it get than a personal attack with someone elected by the people they represent to be attacked directly as a human being because they happen to be from another party with a different point of view. The perversity of partisanship is nothing more than the arrogance of power. And the arrogance of power is corrupting of individuals. Individuals who think power is more important than policy, who think power is more important than output, who think power is more important than anything else that they're worried about, are people that, in my opinion, deserve to be elected. But the perversity of partisanship has taken over, and particularly the federal process. Thank goodness our states do a better job. But the perversity of power in Washington is endemic. Just walk the Capitol Hill, Pauls. And I've sat in meetings with Speaker Reed, and I've sat in meetings with former Majority Leader Pelosi, or former House Speaker Pelosi. I've sat in, in, in meetings with their Republican counterparts and I've heard one attack the other in ways that are just fun fundamentally embarrassing. I want to ask the question, is this Capitol Hill or is this a freshman class in high school? The 
second problem, the second barrier to overcome, is the political time mentality that trumps all energy time thinking. Political time mentality is the amount of time between now and the next election. It's getting shorter and shorter by the day. The maximum period of political time thinking is two years. Because after this November, come December, you better start thinking about the next election. And what matters is the election, not what happens in between the election. Because it's all about the power, isn't it? And so the desire for power, the electoral process plays to that. And so people manage their affairs, they set their priorities, and they take their actions based upon the political time priorities and positioning for the next election. Whereas in the energy business, and the plan I just described, isn't going to happen in a two-year period. We're not going to get 10 million barrels a day between now and November of 2014. Not going to happen. 2022, 2024, yeah, maybe. But we need consistent application of policy, commitment to a direction, and the enablers to, uh, to allow that to occur over an extended period that could run over five elections or more. And the same with the natural gas, the 30 BCF of natural gas. Energy time projects take a long time. And we can't let ourselves be abused by the political time priorities of a process that is only about power. What about the people? And the society and the economy? And thirdly, and perhaps this is the biggest barrier of all, third, we have got to come to grips with the size, function, and structure of government at the federal level. The size, structure, and function of government at the federal level, ladies and gentlemen, and I give this speech in Washington, Quite often, you can imagine how popular I am. I ask the simple question as I visit executive branch appointees. Can somebody please explain why it takes 13 cabinet level officers of the United States executive branch to govern energy? Couldn't we do with 12? <laughs> how about 11, 10, 9? Why 13 plus the president? Do we actually need 13 cabinet level executives to govern our energy system and process so that the head of the Department of Transportation, the head of the Department of Interior, the head of the Department of EPA, the head of the Department of Transportation, Commerce, Labor, State, you name it. We didn't do the Keystone Pipeline because the Department of State couldn't get their head around it. Well, of course, they had some advice from the president who also was much minded about the political side of decisions that he had to make in terms of his own re-election. But in the Midwest, the Keystone Pipeline decision is not popular. Or I should say the non-decision. Because that's where the jobs would have been. That's where a lot of median income families live who don't like high gasoline prices. 13 executive branch agencies plus the White House govern energy. So if you want relief, go to Capitol Hill, right? Yeah, wrong. 26 committees, 26 committees between the House and the Senate governing energy and the environment. So when I trump the steps of the House and ask why not 25, why not 24, 23, 22, oh, you can't do that. These people have seniority. They have earned their chairmanship. They're not about to give up their committee or their chairmanship. That's what they're elected for. Yes, power, right, power. It's all about power. And if you want help in the courts, well, some of us in this state know about courts, such as the 9th District in San Francisco. We know that one well. Seven years for my former company to get a permit to drill a couple of wells offshore, thanks to the 9th District in large measure. 800 federal judges, ladies and gentlemen, can set energy policy in this country. 800 judges appointed for life. And a case for energy brought ahead and brought to their court, their bench. And whether they know anything about energy or not doesn't matter. What matters is the ruling from the bench. So between 800 federal judges, 26 congressional committees, and 13 cabinet agencies, is it any wonder that on a political time priority and an environment of maximum perversity of partisanship, nothing happens? Is it any wonder that you have lost control in Alaska of the 
fundamental development of your, of your natural resources to that monstrosity of a structure and a process. But it's not just Alaska. It's Texas. It's Oklahoma. It's Louisiana. It's Colorado. It's New Mexico. And the states of South Carolina and North Carolina and Virginia and Georgia, where the state legislatures have each in their own time with governors in agreement have said we want to drill offshore, guess what? They can't. Not even in state waters. Because the Interior Department refuses to open access on the Atlantic Ocean coast. Something is really wrong here that has to be addressed. And we can fix this by doing three things. Let me start with a government reform. A reform that this country has been through before. A reform that is turning the political into the practical. And the reform is mildly controversial, but yet we've had 99 years of experience and success with the history of what happened before, which could happen again. What am I talking about? Well, if you look at the history of this country, from the founding of the nation to the early days of the 20th century, our political leadership kept kicking down into the future a decision with respect to whether or not this country would have a central bank. We never decided to have a central bank in this country because we couldn't get our heads around it. We always worried about too much government. We always worried about states' rights. We always worried about the importance of the proximity, the nearness of banking to where the, where the market lived. And so we always put off the decision. And then in 1907, the nation's monetary system collapsed. Collapsed. The nation was in default. J.P. Morgan himself, living at that time, and his friends on Wall Street floated a loan to the federal government to refloat the monetary system on a promise that we'll never let this happen again. Well, it did in 1912. In 1912, the nation's monetary system collapsed a second time. You know, we don't teach this in high school, do we? We don't teach this in college, unless you really dig into the nation's economic history. Nobody knows about this. But two collapses in the first decade of the 20th century. In 1913, President Wilson signed what was called the Federal Reserve Act. The Federal Reserve Act, coming into a law through a democratic process, small d, signed by President Wilson, put the monetary system under an independent regulatory authority in which neither Congress nor the White House determined what was legislatively authorized by the law, the Federal Reserve Act. And so the governors of the Federal Reserve, appointed by the President with advice and consent of the Senate, could make decisions in the interest of the nation, monetary decisions with respect to money supply, an interest rate, an open market window, and the right of intervention, as an independent regulatory authority where Congress could just watch. They always had the opportunity to change the law because they are the legislation of the nation. But for 99 years in the times in which they've had an opportunity to change the law, what have they done? They've made it stronger. Dodd-Frank makes the Federal Reserve stronger, not weaker. And every legislation affecting the Federal Reserve from 1913 to today has reinforced the role of the Federal Reserve because Congress in its wisdom knows that it knows nothing about the monetary system and how to manage it because it's driven by such political issues in election time or political time. And the White House leaves it alone as well, except once every four years chooses its chairman again with the advice and consent of the Senate. And otherwise, it leaves it to Bernanke, leaves it to the Board of Governors to determine the money supply, the interest rate, price, the open market window, and when, and not, when or not to intervene, not Congress, not the President. Isn't energy as important to this nation as the monetary system? Isn't affordable energy 
as critical to the economic success of this nation, which is what propelled the 20th century growth of the world's largest economy, affordable energy. Electrons priced at a rate at which people could both live comfortably and pay their electric bill. Transportation fuels priced at a level that people could both live the lifestyle they chose, pay their other bills, and live where they wanted to live. Now it's becoming unaffordable. In a few years, it will become unavailable if we stay on the path we're on. Because China has discovered the joy of transportation fuel and what it does for its citizens. And there won't be enough oil globally for China to optimize, for India to optimize, for the US to optimize, unless we do something very different. And it's the governance of energy that has got to be different. And so I'm suggesting that it's time, as the first step, to reform government to create an independent regulatory commission to do four things for energy. One, to set the parameters over a 50-year time horizon of what energy we will use to supply our energy needs. How much hydrocarbon, how much nuclear, how much alternative or renewable energy, how much hydrogen, how much hydropower, how much biofuel. And then the companies in the industry, just like the banks and the monetary system, they go do their business. They go do their job, but they know the direction. They know where we're headed. And the second parameter, make sure we use energy efficiently, which means making some technology choices along the way, which enable us to use energy more efficiently. And whether that's the use of superconductivity and transmission lines, or whether that's the use of fewer internal combustion engines because of preferences for hydrogen fuel cells over the next 20, 30 years, or batteries as, they get, as the technology evolves, we can use energy more efficiently differently if we make some technology choices. Third, we need to protect the environment, the land, the water, and air, and let's set the parameters for waste management of land and water and air through this independent agency. The EPA is nothing but a political poodle of the president. And I don't know about you, but I don't like to see politicians determined to get elected or reelected deciding how we live. Because they do it in their own interest. And in this system, this US system, it's the money that talks. And the money that talks to politicians should not be the basis on which we set the parameters for how we manage our waste that affects our land, our water, and our air. We've seen enough of that. And we've seen the harm that it does. I met the guy that wanted to crucify my company down in the 6th district of the EPA. I met him a few weeks after he was appointed. I was in a meeting with other energy executives. We asked him the question, what are your priorities? His answer was very clear. He said, my number one priority is to undo the environmental degradation in this region of the last eight years. I said, you know, we've been in this region the last eight years, and we've spent hundreds of millions of dollars improving the environmental performance of our facilities. You're insulting the work that we did under the last administration to clean up the air and to make this state a cleaner state. How am I supposed to work with you? Later on, he said to somebody else, well, we need to crucify the first five people we see, teach them a lesson. Thank goodness he's gone. But you have to ask, who appointed him? He had no qualifications. He was an environmentalist, then he became a college professor. What does he know about governing the environment of the 6th District, which is the breadbasket of the nation's oil and gas industry, particularly the downstream? Well, he's gone. But environment is important. The fourth authority would be to make sure we have the infrastructure in place that carries energy from where it's produced to where it's consumed. Infrastructure is the number, it's the Achilles heel of our energy system. Anyone trying to build a pipeline knows that. The infrastructure is very hard to get approved. Anybody wants to put a drilling rig in the Arctic Sea, good luck. The infrastructure is resented and resisted by politicians worried about taking care of the funders. So the Independent Regulatory Commission reform 
for energy is step one. Step two, our citizens need to know what they're facing into with respect to the energy future. I founded Citizens for Affordable Energy for one purpose and one purpose only. It is to create an army of volunteers across this nation. So far, we have ambassadors in 12 states. To create an army of volunteers who are willing to go out and tell their story, the story of the energy future, the story of potential prosperity, the story of taking care of our children and their children. In this time, while there's still time, so that they don't live in a third world country that is energy poor because of decisions not made. So informing our citizens, our citizens of the reality, it's not easy. And I don't take any money from energy producers to try to do this because we'll be looked at scams at. People would say, can't trust you, you're using oil money. Can't trust you, you're using coal money. Can't trust you, you're using wind money or, or solar money. So we only take contributions from consumers. And thank goodness there have been some consumers willing to part with a six-figure amount to help us get going. And less, single-figure amounts matter too. And third, once we have an informed citizenry, we activate. We activate this citizenry. This citizenry is so, so powerful when it gets its mind to do something in a particular direction. The president learned that message after the November election of 2010, when he looked ashen-faced the morning after the election, realizing he'd lost the House of Representatives in two short years because the people spoke. I'm a Democrat saying this. I'm not trying to pick on the president. He lost the plot somewhere along the way. I'm not sure he's found it yet because of where we are. But he's not alone in taking us where we've come to. He's had a lot of help from his enemies and his friends. But the activation of the people, and whether it's people from the right or the left or the middle, it's all the people. It's all the people that matter. But we have to do something. In the state primary of Texas, three weeks ago, a grand total of 11% of the population voted in the primary in Texas. 11% in the nation's second or third largest state. How's that for a turnout? And what are the elected officials going to do when they realize they're elected by such a small, small percentage of the population? They're going to do whatever they want, counting on a small turnout the next time around. And now in this critical juncture, in this nation's economic history, and we face another election, what the Democratic Party is most worried about is low turnout, because that would be a bad day for them. What the Republican Party is working on is more turnout, because that might be a good day for them. But turnout is abysmal. So with information, with government reform, activation is no simple task. But if people are paying five or more dollars a gallon for gasoline, which they will be, and if people are standing in gas lines, which they will be, and if people are experiencing more and more blackouts in the, in the state in which they live, which they will be, because I haven't spent any time on the power generation system here, but recognize the power generation system in this country, the largest, the most powerful, the most technologically advanced power generation system in the world is also the oldest power generation system in the world with no plan to update it, no plan to upgrade it, other than get rid of coal plants, other than don't renew nuclear plant, don't build new nuclear plants. That's not a plan. That's an absence of a plan. That's a vacuum of leadership on power generation, which if we addressed significantly would add perhaps another trillion dollars of spending to the national capital investment of private money. But we don't have time to go down that path. I'm stuck with transportation fuels. But ladies and gentlemen, this is a country. This is a country on the cusp of prosperity, the cusp of renewing, of rejuvenating, of rekindling, of remaking, of redoing what we've done before. The journey to become the world's largest economy with a small population of just 300 million people, 100 million people back then, 
150 million people, God is to be the world's largest economy. Imagine what 300, 350, 400 million people by 2040 could do to rebuild this nation as the world's leading nation. There's no guarantee China's going to be number one. Not if we put our brains and our innovation and our political enablers behind our desire to live the life that we aspire to for our children and their children. And the time is now. The time is now to say, even before we're fully informed, even before we're fully activated, let's fix this. We know how to do it. It's not hard. It just takes some leaders with plans to execute, supported by the great minds and efforts and energy of the American people to make it happen. It's all over to us, ladies and gentlemen, because they're not going to do it. People in Washington are not going to do it. And thank goodness we're in the system we're in. Because when we speak, they listen. When we say what we need, when we say what we mean, when we say what we want them to do, they have no choice. Because there'll be history. And they don't like that thought. So let's pursue information, activation, and the appropriate country, the best is yet to come. And I say that with all the 